As always, I'm a little bit intimidated to speak after people like this who talk about the, the really in-depth knowledge about multiple myeloma. And then I talk about imaging, but maybe it's good because it's before the break, so you can kind of relax your mind and just look at the images. And, um, but I think uh, there was actually the, the way that this, this session was built is very good because I will try to convince you that even in this very deep analysis of the proteins, deep analysis of the genes is um, very important and very helpful. To, teaches us a lot about the biology of the disease. I think even imaging can add to that. So my, my question was uh, novel imaging techniques in evaluating myeloma, presentation, relapse, and MRD. I'm out of breath here from just jumping on the stage. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit in, uh, embarrassing. I, I try to catch my breath. So and at, at MRD, so why is it interesting um, to do it at MRD? And I think that's important to discuss. My disclosures. You, have, you might have seen this uh, as an introduction slide of a lot of t uh, treatment. Um, sessions or treatment talks about multiple myeloma. This is history and you all know that we have so many more drugs. But I actually attempted to, to do that for imaging as well and you see there's also development. And um, when I came from Europe to the US I was not shocked but surprised that um, skeletal survey is still kind of the thing that everyone does. And now we're working hard on changing that because I really think we should not stay only with melphalan and some people even ha hate high dose melphalan. That would be a whole other can of worms to, um, to start this discussion. But I think X-ray is kind of the era of melphalan um, and we, we are far beyond that and we are talking about mass spec and single cell sequencing. So we should not talk about uh, X-ray too much anymore. To start this session, I also want to, or no, this talk, I also want to emphasize that, uh, and a lot of people know that, of course, but uh, my experience is a lot of radiologists forget that, actually, and also we, we as hematologists forget that, that myeloma is obviously a disease of the bone marrow, but the symptoms are oftentimes shown in the bone, and that's what brings most of our patients to us. They have bone problems. But when we do imaging, we can do imaging for the bone, and we can do imaging for the bone marrow. So there's a difference, and I would, would like to, to explain that. So again, the disease is in the bone marrow, the symptoms are in the bone. So what, what are the questions that we have when a patient comes to us at the first diagnosis? You know, most of them come with back pain or something like that, and then we have to know, okay, how, how, what is the extent of the bone destruction? Um, are, they, are there any instabilities? Is there a risk of fracture, or has a fracture already occurred? Uh, and also, uh, is osteoporosis caused by myeloma, is osteoporosis caused by changes in the hormonal setting, maybe in an elderly lady, um, and also is how much bone marrow is involved. And you heard already, and I, I like the slide of course uh, from Gareth, showing that myeloma is not a homogeneously distributed disease in the bone marrow, it can be patchy, it can be in focal lesions, and we'll go into that in some more detail, and can even be in the soft tissue. Um, it was interesting to see over time, I, I read a lot of papers, of course, about imaging because it's my, my area of interest. So I saw that um, in the beginning, soft tissue tumors were, okay, we have plasmacytomas and that's what's, what is it about in, in myeloma of soft tissue tumors. But now that we do more sophisticated imaging, we find more and more patients with also soft tissue tumors, especially in the relapse setting, especially after very intensive treatment like CAR T cells. So it becomes more and more relevant to, to also look into this realm. Short information on x-ray, um, there's a very old study already um, showing that you have to destroy, and it was actually, I, I always like to talk about it because it was really nice, cute, how they could do research and publish research in, back in the day. Um, they actually <laughs> took the spine of a corpse and drilled holes in it, filled it with water, and then they did an x-ray, and they did it more and more and more, and they found that you have to destroy 50 to 75% of the bone structure until you see anything in x-ray. And I mean, I just want to like, like let that sink in. Um, this is not what we want. We don't want to wait until half the bone is gone uh, before we treat our patients. So I think we have to be more sensitive. And this is actually a patient I just saw recently, and she's just now going for transplant. I saw her yesterday, actually, uh, and she came and um, she came with an X-ray, and she had pain in her hip. Of course, yeah, a lot of people have pain in their hips. So um, we did a CT because we thought, okay, maybe the X-ray is not good enough, and you can see here there's even 
myeloma growing out of the bone, there's not really much bone left in this area. And if you look at the x-ray, I mean, I have seen a lot of x-rays, but I would not have seen this tumor. So this is kind of, of course, uh, N equals one, but really we have to do better than just x-ray. That's the message here. And we did a comparison with um, uh, collaborators all over the world, and they sent us x-rays and CTs at the same time, and we compared it, and we found about 25% found about are negative in x-ray and positive in CT. I think, again, that should really lead us to, uh, to use better imaging techniques. Interestingly enough, we looked also where those osteolytic lesions were and when, what we found and what surprised us a little bit, that actually x-ray is not really worse, sometimes even better in the appendicular skeleton. So if you have, for example, not we don't have a CPT code yet, I can tell you we're working on a CPT code for whole body load OCT, uh, which I'm promoting here. Um, so we, we, if you don't have access to that, if the insurance gives you um, pushback on that, you can do a CT of the, of the, um, the uh, spine and pelvis, and you can add the appendicular skeleton with x-ray if necessary. I still uh, really promote the whole body load CT, but if you cannot have that, at least uh, um, the spine and pelvis should be a CT. And then you can see uh, in the, the x-ray is actually pretty good in the appendicular skeleton if that is a problem. Um, st stability is very important and it becomes more and more important the more sophisticated your imaging techniques are. When we did x-ray we barely had any issues because we just didn't see what's happening and now since we do CTs we see holes in the C2, we are very concerned about that. I'm surprised that our orthopedic surgeons and our neurosurgeons are not too concerned about it and I have to say I haven't seen too many issues. I just had a patient, again I saw her yesterday, um, and she had a C2 lesion which was Basically, she had a fracture of C2, which is breaking your neck, basically. Uh, and she was doing well. They, Of course, they did surgery and they did radiation, but um, she, she's alive and she's well, actually. She has a stiff neck right now, but we saw that in CT, in X-ray, we might have seen the fracture, of course, but before that happened, uh, we would not have seen too much. So it's important to know that, and I think it's not really our job, but we have to educate our ortho orthopedists and neurosurgeons to um, know what, what are the criteria for stability and also these publications are pretty old. There's a lot of information in, um, in the literature already what we should look for for um, stability. For example, more than 50% collapse of the spine. Uh, if the pedicles are involved, um, if there is more of than 50% of the whole vertebra involved, and also if the anterior and or the posterior parts of the vertebral body is involved. And it helps. We have a tumor board once a week and we show these images, or actually our radiologists show us the images, so we learn something, but we can also educate them and say, hey, please look for this, look for that. And in my experience, this is a very, uh, very fruitful collaboration. I mentioned osteoporosis. You know, it's not that common in myeloma. It's most of the time it is uh, focal osteolytic lesions, but some patients really have this diffuse osteoporotic, uh, osteoporotic change. And here MRI is very helpful because the MRI based on the water content of a tissue gives you the information if you have a high cellularity or low cellularity. High cell cellularity, most likely malignancy, in our case myeloma. Low cellularity um, is rather uh, like fatty, more fatty bone marrow. It's rather uh, associated to old age. So this is very helpful if you have a patient maybe with fractures but the M-spike is not very high and you know we have those oligosecretory myelomas and maybe it's an elderly lady. So that's, it's very helpful to have an MRI um, to see these changes there and the radiologists again are very helpful uh, with differentiating that. Soft tissue I mentioned it is happening at first diagnosis. Um, it is very much happening in, in later relapses, as you know. Uh, and here are several images, and these are patients um, who really had, had severe pain, and we, we found the, uh, the diagnosis with, with the sophisticated imaging. PET CT is what we decided in our, um, uh, in our guidelines, in our new guidelines, but if you don't have access to PET CT, which is not a big thing in the US, usually we get a PET CT if we have a good reason, um, but MRI is also very helpful, especially in, in the brain, which hopefully is not happening very often. Prognostic significance of the tumor burden. I mentioned that there's this focal growth, so we can basically count the focal lesions. We can measure them. We don't have to measure all of them because a lot of myeloma patients, especially at first diagnosis or in later relapses, have a lot of uh, focal lesions. But we can count them or at least say they are, uh, there are focal lesions. 
and um, the, the lower panel shows you that in every stage of disease, morpho lesions are worse. So either in MGAS, which is very rare, but in smoldering myeloma and in multiple myeloma, if you have more focal lesions, if you have a higher tumor burden, that is not a good prognostic sign, obviously. So we heard a lot about MRD, and I like the, the ideas to maybe adjust our treatment uh, to the MRD. We are, we are getting those studies hopefully soon. We are getting the results hopefully soon. But uh, what I would like to mention is that imaging also helps us. If MRD is negative, it says a lot, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, we have done, uh, or I have, I've looked into the literature, we have done some, several analyses ourselves, but if you look into MRI, if you do a whole body MRI of a spinal, uh, or a spinal and pelvic MRI, if you have residual lesions after treatment, it is not good, but you can see the p-values are not very, very impressive, so MRI is okay, but not the greatest um, uh, technique for this, because MRI doesn't show you if these, these lesions that you have are still active, and if they're inactive, if just an osteolytic lesion that has not healed, and I will go into the area of healing osteolytic lesions later on, um, if you have residual lesions after therapy uh, in MRI, that's not good, but the better technique definitely is PET-CT, and there has been several publications now um, showing that residual lesions after therapy, and sometimes even in MRD-negative patients, are of an adverse prognostic uh, significance, which is relevant because if we do a biopsy of our pelvis, we might miss something somewhere else in the body. So the combination of imaging and an MRD assessment, I think, is very important, and in this case, PET-CT is the best that we have by now. The reason for that is obvious. I told you about the focal lesions, and if you do a, a biopsy here in this focal lesion, you might find an MRD positivity, but if you do it here, as we usually do, that's the area where we do our bone marrow biopsies, it might be negative. So it's very important to keep in mind that myeloma is not always homogeneous in the bone marrow. And there's, uh, from the French study, they compared MRD and PET-CT, and they found that some patients are MRD positive and or MRD negative and PET positive, or MRD uh, negative and PET negative, and so you can have it all over the place. It's a, now already a little bit older study, but even the newer studies um, show similar results. So there's, if you look in, in two publications, one of them, I, I forgot the, the citation here, um, is from, from Gareth's group, uh, Leo Rashi published that. Um, if you have MRD negative and PET-CT negative, that is the best um, outcome for the patients because then, of course, the tumor burden is the lowest. And I th I'm, I'm very, looking for, very much looking forward to get this information also for the mass spec to see if kind of the mass spec shows us that there are residual lesions in the body somewhere producing this protein. Um, a newer technique, and the title was uh, newer imaging techniques or novel imaging techniques, is diffusion-weighted imaging, which is an MRI technique that measures, I already mentioned, MRI looks for the water content in the tissue, and more cells means more water, uh, more water, but also more lipophilic cell membranes, and so the water molecules we can measure with MRI, we can measure the movement of water molecules in the tissue, and if you have a lot of lipophilic cell membranes, the water molecules, molecules cannot move that far. If you have a lower uh, cellularity, if, you're more, if you have more necrosis, then they can move further. So you can, to a certain degree, differentiate between high and low cellularity and also quantify that. It's a little bit difficult because, as you can see on the uh, left side of the panel, there's also some influence of perfusion because also water molecules move in blood vessels, obviously. So there's some influence on that, and we are working on to make that better. But it is very helpful, and I can show you images here. It basically looks a little bit like like uh, someone called it the poor man's pet. Um, if you have access to diffusion-weighted imaging in the MRI, you get a very good um, contrast between high cellularity areas and low cellularity areas. And this you can see before and after therapy. After therapy, there are still uh, lesions, but it's less. And the, the benefit is you don't need any contrast agent, you don't need any radiation exposure, and now our patients live longer. So when patients lived for two years, we were not too concerned about radiation, but our patients ask about that because they live, as you know, uh, much longer nowadays. Um, and comparing FDG PET with diffusion-weighted imaging, again, Gareth's group did that, and they showed that if you have um, PET negative, that's good, but if you have diffusion-weighted imaging negative, that's even better, um, and uh, if they have no focal lesions in, in either, that's basically the best. 
and they looked uh, comparing again this comparison of uh, diffusion weighted imaging positive negative and PET CT positive negative and you can see here about 10% uh, more sensitivity for the diffusion weighted imaging. And there's new development uh, coming from here and other places. Ola Landgren's group is working on that, um, doing CD38 directed uh, um, uh, tracers for PET, which is obviously better because, as you know, myeloma oftentimes is not very active in PET CT. So a CD38 uh, attached tracer would be very desirable. And there's first data and showing that it is much more sensitive for myeloma. And since we are talking about MRD negativity and hopefully soon a cure for multiple myeloma, we really have to de detect small amounts of residual um, cells. And I'm not sure if we will see a difference between mice and tigers, but I really like that, uh, <laughs> like this um, analogy. And so we will have to learn more uh, also the, the CD38 expression uh, on those cells. And comparing, also we heard about high-risk uh, disease. And again, uh, same as with MRD, uh, it's the same with imaging. If you have a high-risk myeloma and it becomes imaging negative, it's much better than a, a standard risk myeloma that is imaging positive. Same story as for MRD. So you see this both are going in parallel and give us the same information. We have to treat our patients into the deepest remission that we can. And again, there might be some mice we can ignore, but most of the time we really would aim for a very deep remission and confirm that with uh, imaging as well. And uh, I mentioned some bone healing. This is a topic that uh, I a lot, uh, get a lot of pushback oftentimes. But since we use CT before and after therapy or PET CT before and after therapy, and actually I, I urged our radiologists, our nuclear medicine people, to do a real, PET, uh, a real CT in the PET CT, not just for attenuation correction. So I really would also recommend, and we have that in the guidelines, that you use a qualitatively better CT in the PET CT, and it's possible the, the scanners can do that. And then you have a good sensitivity even after therapy, and this is a patient after treatment with a, a proteasome inhibitor and bisphosphonates, and after high-dose chemotherapy in about a year apart, those, uh, those CTs. And you can see on the left side, there's this huge oscillatic lesion in the lumbar vertebra, and on the right side, you see at the rim of this oscillatic lesion, there's some, some bone healing process, and our, our patient are very happy to hear that because when I started to treat myeloma we had x-ray and we said okay myeloma lesions never heal so we see some healing we don't know what's really happening there we looked into a um, into a data set it's not really clear which patients show this healing process and which don't but there's something happening and we are looking in more detail into that. So at Relapse, we are basically having the same questions. Uh, we want to know if there's any instability. We want to know if the bone disease is worse. We want to know if there are new focal lesions in areas that are concerning. And of course, as I mentioned uh, several times now, soft tissue tumors, especially in, early, in later relapses and in relapses after very intensive treatment, are a relevant factor. To summarize, um, Please, if you have access and if you need help, let me know. Um, CT is better than X-ray. That's one of the major messages here. If you need help, we have sequences. I can send you a sequence. I can send your radiologist a sequence set, and they can put it on their machine, and it's really not a big deal. We are working on getting a CPT code because that's more challenging than the actually technical uh, challenges that we have to deal with. Stability is very important and we should not ignore that because our patients might live 10, 15, 20 years with their myeloma. We don't want them to lose, I don't know, um, 10 centimeters of their height. Uh, we would like to prevent them from that. Um, PET CT is at the moment the, uh, the technique of choice in the setting of MRD assessment and um, or in combination with MRD assessment uh, to see if there are residual focal lesions. Maybe in the future the diffusion weighted imaging is even better. And combining imaging and MRD is very important because you might miss something if you just do a bone marrow biopsy in the pelvis. And maybe if we have mass back in every clinic in uh, five years, I will not give talks about imaging anymore. But until then, you will not get rid of me. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm ready for questions now, I think.